exciting things happening here in the mountains, here in Kentucky, here in America, frankly. And this is really what I'm grateful for. You've heard it said uh, that without vision, the people will perish. Uh, it's biblical, it's, 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 it's old, it's time in some respects, but it's also very true. If you don't have a vision, the odds of succeeding, the odds of accomplishing what you would hope to, of ending up in a better place, not great. Without vision, the people will perish. The very same thing could be said for this community. That's why I'm so grateful to those who have been leaders, who have really been spearheading this, saying, what is our vision? They've come over here on the road. You see roads are being widened. You see land is being leveled. You see investments are being made. But what you see with this drone port, with this whole idea of aerospace and the innovation associated with what happens when we look up, all of this, this is what vision is about. Because think about this. I mean, everybody, every one of us, when we're born, when we're little, every one of us is a dreamer. I have one of my nine children here, uh, my nine children here today, and his aspiration is to be a NASCAR driver, uh, and he may well be. His backup plan is to be a fighter pilot. He may well be. But the point is this. When you're young, you have dreams. You have things that you aspire to. People who end up at the end of their lives, having never accomplished any of these things, people look back on them as just dreamers. They're people who just had a dream. There are people, however, that history looks back on and thinks of as visionaries, which is back to the having of vision. What's the difference between somebody that people look back on as being just a dreamer versus someone that people look back on as someone who's a visionary? It's one thing, simply, really. It's action. It's as simple as that. It's not that complicated. It doesn't mean you're always going to be successful. It doesn't mean that the vision will come to absolute fruition exactly as anticipated. Sometimes there's zigging and zagging along the way. But the reality is this, what is our vision? What is it that we're doing? I'm so grateful to this community. Representative Fugit, your work that you've done uh, in Frankfurt to get people excited about this, the work that's been done with Secretary Chow at the federal level, so many at the state level within the, the U.S. Congress, with Congressman Rogers, U.S. Senate, and Senator McConnell. A lot of attention being drawn to us. I'll tell you briefly my vision for Kentucky. It's a simple one. If I were to ask you all in this room, if you could, if you had to engineer and manufacture something, anything, an aerospace related component or anything else, you had to engineer it from the first conception to the final production, you had to do it all in a single country in Europe, where would you likely start? Anyone? Germany. Germany. 100% of the time, about 99% of the time, that's what people think of first. Then why is it the only place you could do it? Of course not. You could do it in any number of other places. But instinctively, it's what we think of. If I ask you the same question, if you wanted to engineer and manufacture something to the highest degree of excellence in the aerospace, the drone arena, or any other, you had to do it in a single state in the United States of America, where would you start? It's not as easy. Literally in this room, if I gave you note cards, I'd get 10, 15 different answers at least. Every one of them is defensible and as good as the next, which tells us two things. One of them I hope would be Kentucky, but truth be told, so too could a dozen other names. Tells us two things. Number one, nobody owns it the way Germany owns it. Number two, if nobody owns it, what else does that tell us? It's available for ownership. Simple as that. This is my vision for Kentucky. Kentucky is going to be the center of engineering and manufacturing excellence in the United States. And the way we're going to do that is to get the entire ecosystem from beginning to end. And you look at the production of metals. 180 different companies here in Kentucky that are making aluminum and aluminum-related products. 180. We have more than 45 steel and steel-related products that are being made in separate companies here in Kentucky. We have more than 250 different resins and plastics companies making things here in Kentucky. These are all people making base level materials that go into everything that's going to be discussed from this stage over the hours ahead and that have been discussed thus far, that are going to be demonstrated out here when we walk outside. And all the things we're talking about are made up of base level components. 
<clears throat> we're also blessed with the logistical capabilities, being in the middle of America. Think about this. How fortunate we are. In a geopolitically uncertain world, a lot of instability, we're in North America, which is kind of the last bastion of any sense of stability in the world. As imperfect as it is, it's remarkably stable compared to many places. And in the middle of North America is the United States, and in the middle of the United States is us, and in the middle of us is this. Here we are. We're right here in the middle of it all. It's not a co coincidence or an accident that UPS has their world shipping hub here in Kentucky that DHL has their North American shipping hub here in Kentucky, that Amazon is building their prime air shipping hub here in Kentucky. It's not a coincidence. It's a result of a lot of good effort and good work, but it's also due to the fact that we're blessed with an amazing geography, an amazing proximity to markets. And all of that lends itself well to everything we're here to talk about because the whole world of logistics and transportation and movement of goods and ultimately of people is being transformed. And what is being pioneered here, the research and development that's happening as it relates to small things like nanosats that's happening up at the Moorhead States or the actual more traditional way of moving things with pilots and maintenance stacks that's being pioneered at places like Eastern Kentucky University and the feeder systems at this school and others that are feeding people into this, all of this, all of this is right here in Kentucky. What are we doing to harness it? That's it. That's our responsibility. This is our vision. What is it we're gonna do to make us the center of engineering and manufacturing excellence? So please know that every day when I go to work, this is my passion. Because if we can get the people that produce the base level materials to be here, the rest will just fall in place. Just last week, you saw, I mean this week actually, I don't know, it's been, crazy week, a couple days ago. We just announced the biggest, newest, most modern steel mill being made in America is gonna be built right here in a rural community in Kentucky, a town of 2,000 people, a $1.4 billion investment that's gonna employ over the next two years, 2,000 workers in a town of 2,000, building a $1.4 billion facility on 900 acres. These kind of things are gonna then produce materials that are gonna make their way right into this industry. This is what is before us. So some of you came here because, hey, you wanted to be supportive. Some of you absolutely to your core believe, and some of you are somewhere in between. But understand this, everything we're talking about is not only possible, it's happening. It's happening right now because time is money. And when you produce the base level materials here and you have the quality of education here and the workforce here and the skill set here to take these metals and these plastics and these other materials and to fabricate them, engineer, design them, produce them, the products that are gonna transform the future, why wouldn't it happen in a place with an incredible quality of life, low energy costs? Tremendous workforce, tremendous values, all the things we're blessed with to the extent we sometimes take for granted. This is happening. It really is. And just as surely as people wouldn't have ever believed you'd see the kind of equipment out here on the roads, making the kind of roads that you see coming up here, it's coming. Not as fast as some people would like, faster perhaps than some would like. But truth be told, the future is coming. The question is, what is our vision? What are we going to do to make sure that we shape it instead of simply reacting to it? And so I'm grateful to each and every one of you for being here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here, to be followed by the two individuals that you're about to hear from who have more to do with all of this than anyone else, frankly, and to whom I'm grateful and to whom I look forward to continuing to partner with and work with. Because as your governor, I'll work with people at the federal level, I'll work with people at the local levels, and we're gonna make this vision into a reality. So that a year and a generation from now, people aren't looking back and saying this was just some sort of an idle dream. This is happening, it's happening right now. Final thing I'll say is this, already in this state, the number one contributor, and you all know this, I'm guessing, because you're here, but when I ask people what they think the biggest contributor to our state's economy is and the biggest contributor to our gross domestic product, I often will hear things like, oh, it must be, you know, uh, agriculture or bourbon or maybe horses. You know, sometimes people will guess automobiles or something of this sort. But here's what's interesting. Automobiles happens to be number two. We're the largest per capita producer of automobiles in America. And yet that's number two. 
the number two, three, four, and five combined don't even come close to number one by itself. The number one by itself is aviation and aerospace and the very things that we're here talking about. We're talking about the next iterations of something that we're already leading the nation in. Only the state of Washington, because of Boeing, exports more products into the aviation and aerospace industry than does Kentucky. Last year, over $12 billion were the products that we made here and sent to the world. Think about this, we're already doing it. Our job is to make sure people recognize it, that we're out there hustling, that we're out there bringing people here. The final thing I'll say is this, we're talking to a company right now that may end up not coming here. It's a company not unrelated to this space, and I won't be more specific than that, but it's a company that employs people who think like so many in this room think, that have a vision for things like some in this room do that's looking for a place in America where they can put 1,000 of their employees, this is a big global company, 1,000 of their employees that would have an average salary of $127,000 a year, so it gives you some appreciation for the kind of training and specialized skills of this group. They were looking at eight different places in America. We were not one of them, we being Kentucky. I went and met with their CEO, I said, why not us? They said maybe to be kind, maybe to humor us, maybe out of appreciation that we came and talked to them, they put us on there as one of nine. They came and visited. They were upside surprised as people often are when they come here because we're out there hustling and we're telling people come and see and experience what we have here in Kentucky. And then we were on a short list of six and they narrowed it down to four and we were still in there, three still in there. It's down to two. They may not yet come here, but if they do, it doesn't matter where in the Commonwealth this would go, it could land in any state next to us. But if you had a hundred million dollar payroll annually dropped into a community where the people earning it were designing and, and involved with the production and utilization and innovation of things like we're talking about here and things related, could you imagine how that's gonna feed into everything you're doing? Unbelievably, in ways we can't even imagine. So just know this, I am out there hustling every day to try to make this vision come to fruition. But it is not going to happen without the people that follow me, without those that have preceded me on this stage, and without each and every one of you. So thank you so much. Continue to hustle. As Abraham Lincoln said, good things may come to those who wait, but only the things left behind by those who hustle. So we'll all be hustling, and I look forward to hustling with you. God bless you. Thank you very much. But I think it is, uh, it is it's giving you the edge. You're among the first. And I sort of like uh, what the governor just said about vision. That's what it's really all about. But I would remind you that old saying that a vision without funding <laughs> is a hallucination. <laughs> And it was with that in mind, uh, was so it a couple of years ago that we were able to get that initial grant uh, to sort of spark this thing along. Uh, and I'm delighted with the progress that uh, you are making. I don't know where we would find a better salesman than the man who just preceded me in speaking, the governor. Uh, he sells Kentucky every day, everywhere. I've been with him on some of those occasions and watched in admiration and awe, frankly, of uh, his capability of, of selling people on Kentucky. That's what he does for a living, in fact, and he is doing a great job like that. I want to say welcome to Eastern Kentucky. I want to say welcome to Silicon Holler. <laughs> I sort of say that in, in half jest, because I really think that's where we're headed. Uh, this first ever drone conference, first ever, is uh, a testament of a grassroots movement that started uh, about six years ago to diversify our economy, and that was the 
thing called SOAR, shaping our Appalachian region. That the governor and I have the honor of uh, co-chairing. So it really is a think tacky group of people looking toward a new twist to our economy of Eastern Kentucky. We have no choice, frankly, but to look for additional ways for our people to make a living and stay here. That's what SOAR is all about, and many of you are involved in that uh, program. When, when the, the war on coal hit us with intensity a few years ago, shut down our minds, sent thousands of our hardest working people uh, to the unemployment line. We began to reimagine ourselves. We've been pretty set in our ways economically for a couple of centuries. At one time, it was timber that dominated the economy of East Kentucky with a lot of good jobs. Eventually, that began to play out. And then, at a subsequent time, the mining of coal began to dominate the economy of East Kentucky. Now, that is diminishing somewhat. Enough so. It causes us to think about what else can we do in addition to mining coal now to keep our young people at home rather than shipping them to Ypsilanti, Michigan. I love Ypsilanti, <laughs> but I want my people building East Kentucky, not Ypsilanti. And that's what the governor is dedicated to as well. Our workforce has historically been uh, expert machinists, master mechanics, builders, welders, engineers. That's exactly what's necessary or needed in the aerospace industry. We have the talent. Many of them laid off. The talented. We have work ethic, the best in the country. Employers around in Kentucky that I've talked to that have installations around the country tell me without question every time that the work ethic they have here is the best in the country. There's a reason for that. One, you're talented people. Number two, you want to stay home. And when you get a job, you work hard to keep that job so you can keep your family here. That translates into work ethic, hard worker quality and talent. I started referring to the region as Silicon Hollow some time back because we, we are building now statewide high capacity, high speed cable. Those are the interstate highways of our age. That's the way you get your raw material for your processor back here. You process it, you ship it out the same way. There's no trucks, trains, planes, canals, rivers. It goes through the air. It doesn't matter then anymore where you live and work. And that's key to our thinking. You don't have to go to Detroit to get a job, or Cincinnati, or Lexington or anywhere else. You can do it here once we get that cable in place. It's about half strong, I think, Governor, the, the cable. Uh, communities are now beginning to plan to latch on to that interstate canal. And I think the drone industry will see a real spurt when we are able to connect with each other through internet uh, cable, high capacity, high speed. And I think that day is coming fast. It's vital to everyone in this room, in your business, in your social life and the like. This is a whole new way for us to tie each other together. This conference, and the uh, USA Drone Corps here in Hazard 
brief examples of the type of ingenuity and out-of-the-box ideas that we dreamed of igniting with the launch of solar. And you are thinking new thoughts. I've got a lot of good ideas, I just can't think of them. <laughs> but you're thinking of them, and you're playing on them, uh, and you're making things work out. You know, and for those of you not from Kentucky, uh, and the hills of Kentucky, our people speak rather bluntly. We tell you exactly what's on our mind. Sometimes it's not good news, sometimes it is good news. But I remember a few years ago, I was driving over here, and I got lost in the mountain roads. And I saw this uh, old fellow sitting on his porch up on the hillside, rocking way up there. So I thought I'd ask him how to get to Hazard. So I got out of the car and hollered up at him, hello. I said, can you tell me how you get to Hazard, Kentucky? Kept rocking in his chair. He said, I'll get my brother-in-law to take me. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful what you ask. You may get a good answer and you may not. But, um, Nevertheless, the work ethic that we have here, combined with the smarts, the ingenuity, the inventiveness that you have and we're having to have now, makes this drone project on the way to success. And I could not be happier with the way it's going. I want to applaud Dr. Jennifer Linden and Bart Massey, everyone here at the school. Uh, brave enough to broaden your horizons and find a silver lining uh, and a dark cloud. The absence of skyscrapers, absence of bright lights of the big cities, makes this a great place for drone activity. Uh, you have clear airspace, you don't have to worry about ramming an airplane here. Uh, and. Uh, you have the lack of night, night, night lights that allow you to operate here in conditions that in many places would not be uh, possible. And that argues well for growing that business right here. Just two years ago, uh, I invited the NASA administrator uh, to Moorhead State University at their Space Science Center, where students are building, students are building small cube satellites. They're programming satellites. They're operating satellites. And uh, it's, it's incredible how that is working over there. The, the NASA administrator was uh, flabbergasted. They got a huge, big building Space science building, space science curriculum, space science degrees, and uh, they're being hired as fast as they can produce um, graduates. Isn't that right? That's an exciting thing. One of the people that is working on that is Bob Skeena, who's with us today. Bob, raise your hand. Stand up so we can. from Philadelphia, but he was looking to locate somewhere with his new, young, modern company on the leading edge of technology. And we introduced him to Moorhead, Kentucky. And he fell in love with Moorhead and Kentucky and, and his project. So he moved his company here, Regent. Moved it from Philadelphia to Moorhead hiring the graduates of the Moorhead School, Space Science School. I told you about Silicon Holler tonight. <laughs> Here's a perfect example of that. Uh, he now is, is uh, inventing and building and running programs that uh, is beyond my comprehension. 
But Kentuckians can do this stuff. We have the natural talent. We have a work ethic. We have the drive to make it work. Uh, and that suits you well in this new age in which we find ourselves. Those graduates, by the way, at that uh, school, they're designing drones, making drones, flying drones. I remember up there a couple of years ago, they demonstrated outdoors. Here comes a swarm of drones <laughs> across the horizon, maybe 25 or 30 of them, swooping down on us. It's an amazing new world in which we find ourselves. And I'm thrilled, excited, that at hazard, you're getting out in front of the parade that's forming. And it will be big time success as we go down through time. Our best days are ahead of us. And you're paving the way with your imagination. And that's what makes it so much fun to be a part of what you're doing here. So good luck as you fly those planes. Now, I am delighted to uh, introduce my friend to you, U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Shaw. Uh, this is her second cabinet position uh, to ensure that we have greater opportunities. She received an MBA degree from the Harvard Business School. She's the recipient of 37 honorary doctorate degrees. 37. Please join me as we welcome home our great Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Shaw. And through his decades of experience and service to the Commonwealth, to the 5th District, he has made so many things happen. So I want you to give Congressman Hell Rogers, your Congressman, another tremendous round of applause. Today. Do you know? I mean, he's the governor and he's at this drone conference. I am so honored and I'm so excited. And as Congressman Hal Rogers says, Governor Bevan is doing a great job. He comes from the business sector, so he knows a lot about increasing employment, creating jobs enticing other companies to come to our commonwealth. And as you've heard, there's been a major announcement just this past week of the new company that Governor Bevan persuaded to come to the commonwealth. So there's no greater salesperson for our commonwealth than our governor. And he is tenacious and hardworking and as he saw from that little story, he doesn't take no for an answer. So he didn't know very much of me. He didn't know Kentucky wasn't in the running. So he just went to this company and just said, you know, give us a chance. And then at first, as he mentioned, you know, they thought, well, maybe, you know, Kentucky would be of interest. So it went from Kentucky was one of 10, then it was one of five, so we're now one of two, and that would not have happened without this governor. So this governor is totally focused on increasing employment, job creation, economic development. 
and our state unemployment rate is at the lowest level it's ever been. And Governor, we want to thank you for what you do for our Commonwealth. And then I got to sit next to Mayor Nan. <laughs> Mayor, we remember the first Mayor Gorman, and we will always remember him and all that he's done for this area. And then I get to see Dewey as well. I mean, heck, it's like homecoming here. <laughs> but of course, Bart Massey's doing a great job, and of course, Dr. Jennifer Linden, who's head of the community college as well. We appreciate all of you. It is always good to come home to Kentucky, and I'm so grateful that you gave me a chance to come here to Hazard. I can't think of a safer place in Kentucky than right now. There's so many dedicated men and women, first responders, and I'm so pleased to join you for this search and rescue drones conference here at Hazard and in this community college as well. Now this conference combines a couple of my top priorities at the department. And the first one is safety. Safety has got to be number one. But secondly, another big focus for the department now is preparing for the future. How do we engage with new emerging technologies to address legitimate public concerns about safety, security, privacy, without hampering innovation. And this is no doubt, this is one of the most exciting periods in transportation history, because new technologies are being developed that have the potential to save lives, revolutionize travel and commerce, and provide new mobility options for the underserved communities, like the elderly and also people with disabilities. Now some of these technologies are still in the early phases, Fully autonomous or self-driving cars, for example, ex exist primarily in limited and controlled circumstances. Um, development is ongoing on something called the Hyperloop transportation system. Reusable rockets have helped the United States regain our leadership in commercial space launches, but drones Drones are the most exciting development that we've seen in a long time. It is a revolutionary aviation development and uh, we've not seen since a jet engine. And drones are well on their way to mainstream deployment. Now as of um, March 2019, we're at the end of the month now, but there are almost 1.35 million registered drones in the United States, of which more than 337,000 are for commercial uses. And there are now more than 126,000 certified drone pilots. I just met one outside, and he learned it in the, in the Army. But five years ago, there was not a category called certified drone operator. How exciting. And new uses are constantly being found for how to deploy these drones, including surveying crops, inspecting damaged homes and infrastructure. We use them in Puerto Rico with the hurricanes in the aftermath of trying to figure out how the roads are. And then also delivering packages and medical supplies. But one field where drones have already proved and continue to prove their worth is in search and rescue. And we have examples of this right here in Kentucky. Last year, I've heard that uh, Georgetown police, following FAA guidelines, bought a drone with night vision and thermal imaging to deal with a rash of car break-ins. The drone was soon employed on the job and looking around, and it actually helped the police catch a burglar hiding up on a building roof. Can you imagine? In the past, the guy would have gotten away with it. And then something that's really kind of touching and sweet, when a grandmother and her grandson and their dog got lost in a field, the drone found them within like 15 minutes. And when a train derailed, 
That same drone allowed emergency response teams to survey the damage, assess the damages, and determine before personnel entered the site whether any of the tank cars were leaking biohazardous materials. Obviously, you don't want to send people into hazardous conditions. And other communities, including Louisville and Bowling Green, have bought and used drones as well. The State Fire Rescue Training Center at Moorhead has started a drone flight school. I've learned and I've really heard more about it here. That's really exciting. And we have attracted experts from throughout the country. So doctor, we're delighted that you came from Philadelphia. We can assure you that you'll have a much better experience here because we're in God's country. <laughs> And here at Hazard, I'm so proud to learn that there's a world-class center for unmanned aircraft systems, for research development and training. And when I first heard about the U.S. drone port, I didn't really understand what that meant. You know, so many of us don't really understand. But it has a wonderful name, and it has such ambition for the future, which is what I love, because that's what Congressman Hale Rogers is talking about. We have to look ahead, and he's going to help us. And so we're looking at the National Unmanned Robotic Research and Development Center. Wow, that is a mouthful. But this is going to equip students in Eastern Kentucky to participate in and benefit from the growth of the drone industry. And the program is already attracting students from around the region, and it will only grow in prestige and influence. So I really want to commend the community, the college, the U.S. Drone Court, its executive director, Bart, that I've already said, uh, is doing a great job for establishing this program. You are not just an en enabling new technology. You're enabling dreams and helping the future transportation infrastructure of our country. You've given the future a place to come home and roost here in Hazard, Kentucky. The training provided by the drone port will help address public concerns about drone operations and good drone pilots will respect privacy, which is a big, big issue. Apparently 54% of Americans don't want drones flying outside their window. <laughs> Really? And another 34% don't want drones flying over their houses unless it's on very limited access. And only 11% kind of feel comfortable with drones. So there's a lot to do. Irresponsible drone flights are another uh, problem. The Department of Interior reported that last year, drone intrusions shut down an aerial firefighting effort against fire, uh, wildfires, uh, wildfires 15 times. This happened in Colorado, in New Mexico, and also in California. So our department is working with these drone and aviation stakeholders to address these problems. Because what's really important is that we have to safely integrate the use of drones into our national airspace. And currently, drones are, requ uh, they re are required to get waivers to fly over the heads of people, to fly outside the line of sight, and to fly at night. But if the drone technology is growing so rapidly, there's got to be a better way to allow the drone operations to occur that will make people comfortable. So, we have set out a notice of proposed rulemaking asking for comments, for people's reactions, and how do we conduct these drone operations safely, securely, and in a, in a private way that will elicit uh, consumer and public support. Because these drones can do so much, but only if people accept them. 
So the public acceptance is very much a part of the whole concept about drone operations. And then in January, the department also uh, contracted with commercial uh, service suppliers who will supply air traffic management with some further integration of drones. So there's a lot of things going on. But this drone air traffic management system will be very important as we talk about how do we further use drones, how their uses become more widespread and valuable. And we want to create a shared information network and gather data that would be useful for future rulemakings as to how we can integrate the drones into the national airspace. And the best practices developed under these programs will allow us to all find out more about drones and how do we um, enter like areas of operation and restrict unapproved restrictions, uh, infra in, uh, infractions and uh, intrusions. So please remember that the department's commitment to first responders goes even beyond drones. We love first responders. First responders keep our communities safe. And so we respect them and we want them to do their job. And so at the department, we have launched a lot of campaigns to support traffic safety, including campaigns to fight impaired driving, distracted driving, and moving over to give first responders room on the, on the road. You'd be amazed, that's a traffic um, you know, hazard as well. If we don't notice first responders on the side of the road helping people. There's even a special division in the, national, in the department's uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that's known as the Office of Emergency Medical Services. So just like the first responders, the department makes safety number one. And I want to be here to thank the first responders for what they do and to know that the Department of Transportation has their back. We appreciate so much what first responders do. We want to have your back and help you to do your job to help our communities. And then lastly, of course, as we have this U.S. Drone Port and the Search and Rescue Drone Conference, we want to thank Hazard Community and Technical College for what they're doing to help shape the future. And Bart, thank you so much again. You're doing a great job and we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here.